Welcome to track one, noon talk. This is uh, Isaac Kotler and Amit Klein. So please give them a welcome to DEF CON. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to the uh, presentation about uh, process injection techniques. Uh, some words about uh, ITSIC, you can see on the screen there. And also a few words about myself. And let's, let's begin. So why do, we do, why do we even care about uh, process injections? Uh, so they, they don't see the slides, actually. They don't see the slides. Yeah. You'll have to believe me on that. <laughs> <laughs> so when we started res researching process injection back in uh, late 2018, uh, we obviously wanted to first understand what other people already did in this area. And to our surprise, we couldn't find any comprehensive collection or catalog of process injection techniques. We found scattered all over the internet in write-ups, in uh, proof of concept codes, and in uh, blogs. Uh, also, we didn't, we didn't find any, um, we didn't find, okay. We did, we couldn't find a text that described the, the solely true process injections, as we like to call them. And the text uh, often uh, took a bit of a liberal approach to what process injection is uh, and uh, lumped into process injection uh, some related but not true process injection techniques like uh, process hollowing and spawning. Uh, also, we couldn't find uh, uh, categorization around the, the sub-techniques sub of process injection, namely process, uh, memory allocation, uh, memory writing, and uh, code execution. And also, we, we, there was a lack of analysis and comparison between uh, process injection techniques. Um, finally, uh, we couldn't find any update for the old uh, uh, techniques that sometimes were developed for in the Windows XP days to uh, Windows 10 uh, with its uh, latest uh, security uh, mechanisms and the 64-bit architecture. Before we begin, uh, I want to uh, extend kudos to Adam of Hexacorn, Ojan, and the Insilo team, and Xaba Fitzel of the, uh, also known as the Evil Bit, and uh, many others that uh, have no, uh, no space here to mention. Uh, for their uh, research, uh, they, their in, uh, invention in, inventions in process, uh, in process injection uh, techniques, uh, development, documentation, and proof of concepts uh, of, in many, of many, many techniques. And of course, head tip to Endgame for providing the first compilation of injection techniques, although that compilation uh, did lump together some non-true process injection techniques. So let us first define what true process injection is. Uh, we are talking about injection from live user space process, uh, typically malware, to another live user space process, which is the, the, the target for injection, which is typically benign or legitimate process. It can be a system process like explorer.exe or a Microsoft Office uh, process, your browser, your messaging software, your email software, what have you. Uh, this is in contrast to, uh, which is out of scope for this uh, project, uh, process spawning and hollowing, uh, and also some pre-execution techniques that require uh, the uh, malware to install or to configure things before the target process starts running, like DLL hijacking, AppCert, AppInit, LSP providers, and image file execution options. Um, so what's, what's important and interesting about Windows 10 and, and about 64-bit architecture? First, uh, Windows 10 introduced several security mechanisms, such as uh, CFG, the control flow guard, uh, which prevents uh, indirect uh, calls to non-approved addresses. And uh, CIG, the code integrity guard, which only allows modules, or uh, as we call them DLLs, to be loaded if they are signed by Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Store, or WHQL. Uh, what's interesting about the 64-bit architecture as opposed to 32-bit architecture is that with 64-bit architecture, the calling convention is different. Uh, the first four arguments of a function are passed through uh, the uh, four uh, 
uh, volatile registers uh, that would be uh, R6, RDX, R8, and R9. So that if so that in order to invoke uh, successfully invoke a function in the target process, you need to control at least one or in, in def depending on the number of arguments in the function up to four registers, as opposed to on as opposed to only uh, cooking up the stack, which was the uh, the uh, 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 which was the way to invoke functions in the 32-bit world. Also in the 64-bit world, there's no uh, pop all registers uh, in opcode. And that prevents us from uh, uh, elegantly populating all registers with uh, desired values. The pro the, there, were, there are a lot of proof, good, proof, uh, excellent proof of concepts out there for uh, uh, injection techniques. Uh, but the problem is that, that is that exact definition. They are excellent proof of concepts. Uh, in, in that, uh, what I mean is that they uh, they handle they they have proper error handling and exception handling. Uh, they are uh, tailored for both 32-bit applications and 64-bit applications. And they also lump together, uh, in this case, uh, the, uh, in, uh, the novel memory writing technique with an execution technique in order to demonstrate a, a full end-to-end -end, uh, process injection. Uh, that makes the uh, source code uh, ex uh, bl blow into 1500s line of code. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, and, I, and as a researcher, I, was, I found it very difficult to focus on exactly what the novelty of the technique is. Whereas what I wanted to find, or wanted, what I searched for, uh, is the, those, those three lines that are, that are wrapped into five lines at the right hand side of the screen, where you can see the exact uh, technique that is uh, the exact technique that is used. In this case, it's atom bombing. So what, I, wh what, uh, what we could not find uh, in many cases uh, is a concise three, four, ten lines of code that, de that describe exactly the technique and nothing more. So we set up to fix this uh, situation and to fill this gap. Uh, and to document all those uh, process injection techniques. And the scope of our project was uh, true process injection, running a sequence of logic or commands in the target process. So we're not talking about just uh, forcing a system uh, function call and, and spawning another process. Uh, the focus was on Windows 10 version 18.03 and above. So we're talking about uh, pretty recent versions of Windows 10. Uh, X64 injection injecting process and X64 target process, both medium integrity. We only look at techniques that do not require admin rights, and we evaluate all the techniques against uh, recent Windows 10 protections, specifically CFG and CIG. Few words about CFG strategy. The attacker that wants to uh, inject into a CFG protected target process has several options uh, to choose from. The first one obviously is to disable CFG and this is possible for a standard Windows API set process valid call targets. Um, however, if you think about it, this is a pretty suspicious ac action in itself and can be flagged by security products. Also, I uh, speculate that it may be disabled or restricted in the future by Microsoft. Another approach would be to allocate or set executable memory, uh, which, uh, as a side effect, makes all the allocated uh, memory CFG valid. Uh, this can be done with uh, virtual alloc X or virtual protect X. But then again, if you think about it, this is extremely suspicious. We all know what happens next. We just allocated a bunch of executable pages in the target process. Obviously, we know what's going to happen. So this is extremely sus suspicious. The third option, and I think this is the future of process injection techniques, is to play by the rules. That is, writing a non-executable data, which is of, can be a ROP chain, and then using a CFG agnostic execution method to run a stack pivot gadget and start running, start executing the ROP chain. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, only very few uh, execution techniques are CFG agnostic, and I will touch on this subject uh, later in this presentation. 
With respect to CIG and other defenses, there used to be there used to be a technique to eliminate those defenses using set process mitigation policy in the target process, invoking that with NTQ APC thread, because that function has only three arguments uh, that NTQ APC thread could cover them all. We'll see that in a later slide. However, this technique no longer works as of 1809. Uh, and I want to mention that CIG is most painful because it prevents us from loading uh, arbitrary non-Microsoft signed DLLs. So what are the typical process injection building blocks? We have memory allocation and when we are, when we are uh, looking at uh, such techniques we need to consider uh, whether the allocation is implicit like a cave or a stack or explicit where we actually allocate the memory by ourselves. What page permissions are there? What control do we have over the allocation address? And whether the target addresses will be CFG valid or not? Then we have memory writing, populating that uh, memory area with our desired values. And the questions are whether the that whether a memory writing technique allows us to write arbitrary data or are there restrictions on size or character set? And whether the writes are atomic or not? Finally, there's the, there are the execution techniques uh, and they need to be evaluated against whether the target has to be CFG valid or not, what controls do we have over the registers, and what limitations and prerequisites are there for the execution methods, and there are a lot of restrictions and limitations for some techniques out there. Without much ado, let's uh, go over some process injection techniques. I'm going to go over very quickly the uh, uh, very known ones and focus a bit more on the lesser known ones. So I'm going to uh, go quickly now. Uh, there's the virtual alloc EX uh, memory allocation technique that we're all familiar with. It can allocate executable pages, so those pages become uh, CFG valid automatically by Windows. And of course, we can only we can allocate to just read, write, and later uh, add the uh, page executor uh, privileges with virtual protect EX. Um, then we have the classic memory uh, writing technique of, of using a uh, write process memory. Again, no prerequisites or limitations. The address is fully controlled uh, with regard to CFG. If the allocation is sets executable privileges, then there are no problems. Uh, CAG is, of course, not uh, relevant because we are not handling DLLs here. And finally, there's the create remote thread execution technique, uh, in which uh, CIG has no impact because we're just we're not talking about DLLs here. And with respect to CFG, the target execution has to be CFG val uh, valid target, and this is very val uh, this is enforced by the, the operating system. Uh, we only have controls over RCX, so we can only safely invoke functions with a single argument in this way. Then we have a classic DLL injection execution technique using again create remote thread, but this time assuming we'll use the writing technique to write the DLL path into the uh, target process already, we invoke create remote thread, uh, we invoke load library A with create remote thread, and the argument of light library, load library A would be the, the path to the DLL already written to the target process. Uh, in this case, uh, the prerequisite is that the, this DLL on disk. And uh, the, please note that DLL main, this is the, what uh, the loader executes uh, in such case, is restricted to the load with the loader lock. CIG, however, blocks this technique, so it no longer works if CIG is turned on in the target process. And uh, I just mentioned that uh, a variant of this technique can use QUSER APC or NTQ APC thread instead of create remote thread. Uh, another well-known uh, ex classic ex DLL injection technique is uh, using set windows hook X, in which case uh, the DLL is loaded to the target process when the target process receives an event of a certain kind. And uh, after we, s we s uh, invoke set windows hook X, uh, we uh, artificially send such event to the target thread and execution ensues. Again, the prerequisite is that the DLL is on disk, and again, CIG blocks this technique. Uh, one other classic uh, execution technique is APC. You can use a QUSER APC, the standard Windows API, or NTQ uh, APC thread, which is the internal function, a more uh, a flexible function and more useful one. Now the prerequisite here starts, starts getting interesting because the thread must be in an alertable state. I'll, take about, I'll talk about that in the next slide. CAG has no impact, we're not talking DLLs here. 
and their CFG uh, is, uh, is, is uh, relevant because the target execution should be valid CFG target, again, uh, enforced by window, uh, Windows at the, uh, 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 at the execution time. Um, Q user APC grants us control over RCX. NTQ APC thread grants us control over two and a half registers, RCX, RDX, and the lower half of R8. This can be quite useful for f functions that uh, accept up to three arguments. Now, what is an alertable state? It, it means that the, uh, that the thread is executing or is hanging in one of five functions, sleep EX, wait for single object EX, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, in, in all five cases, it means that the actual uh, internal function exec uh, uh, executed in which the thread is hung is anti-delay execution, anti-wait for single object, and so forth. They all follow the same pattern. They all follow the same template of code, in which case the RIP is in uh, uh, the entry point, like anti-delay execution pl plus hex 14. So therefore, very easy to uh, discover whether a thread is in an alertable state if you know it's RIP. So this is one handy, uh, uh, handy uh, byproduct of our research. Moving on to another pretty known technique, uh, the suspend inject uh, resume thread execution. Uh, as the name hints, we suspend the thread, and then we set the RIP using set thread context to our desired execution lo location, and then we resume the thread. The thread starts running in the new location. Now. With respect to CFG, amazingly, there is no impact. Uh, there is no check in, in Windows anywhere that this is a, a CFG valid uh, address because there's, it, 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 it does not represent a callable function in the first place. Um, there is a bit of a restriction on RSP. It should be within the stack allocated region. Uh, as for control over registers, there is no guaranteed control over the volatile registers. Uh, this is a bit of a puzzle. As in some processes, uh, we can control those uh, volatile registers. In others, we cannot. So we assume the worst. We assume we cannot control the volatile registers. What if we all can only write uh, read write memory, no execution in the target process? Well, we can use the write primitive uh, to write uh, ROP chain uh, to the target process and then uh, set the uh, RIP to a stack pivot and start executing the ROP chain through this mechanism. Now, here is uh, an exotic uh, technique that's uh, not too well known. It's called ghost writing. I believe it dates back to 2007. And it's a monolithic technique in the sense that it carries out both uh, memory writing and execution uh, together. So it's quite similar to thread hijacking, but uh, without the need for memory writing uh, um, primitive. The idea here is that memory writing is achieved in steps using set thread context to set the regi to, to set registers, and that the each at, at the end of each step the thread is running an infinite loop, which will be our success marker. Once the uh, the malware sees that the thread is in the in the in its infinite loop marker, it knows that it's safe to move to the next step. So we need three ROP gadgets for this. Uh, a sync gadget is simply an infinite loop, a JMP minus two, which will be the marker of a successful end of execution. I believe it's just two bytes of, uh, of opcodes. And then we have a write gadget, something like a move into the uh, uh, set by RDI, the value of RBX, followed by a return. And then a stack pivot or something equivalent. So the first step is to write on stack the uh, address of the infinite loop and, the br and, and using the write gadget. And the finally, the return from the write gadget will branch into the infinite loop. And uh, this will mark the successful end of this step. Moving to step two, we write ar arbitrary keywords. Uh, so we repeatedly execute step two until we have all the memory that we need uh, written to the target process. And the idea here is to use the right, to, to, to start the registers uh, and to point at the right gadget so that the right gadget will write this keyword and then the, its return will branch right into the uh, uh, infinite loop. So marking the successful end of writing a single keyword and repeating this process as, of, uh, as many times as needed to write all the arbitrary memory we need. 
Finally, we just set our IP and RSP uh, to desired value to start a, a, a um, stack pivot or something similar and to start running over the ROP chain. One uh, one lovely location for uh, for the new stack is the unused part of the existing stack. And here are some tips of how to do this right. Uh, first, you need to maintain some distance from the official top of stack, the RSP value, in order to, to provide some space for stack for natural stack growing as, as it, the stack is used by Windows API calls. But on the other hand, you can't go too far because the stack is limited by one megabyte. So something like 64 kilobytes is probably in the, in the, in the, in, in the right neighborhood. Now you need to grow the stack uh, uh, one page at a time, one guard page at a time in order to get from the TOS to where you really want to start writing your own stack. And you do that by touching the memory at page size intervals so that the, the, uh, the guard page would, will keep, uh, uh, so the uh, kernel will keep committing new pages uh, as, as, as we follow this algorithm. Finally, you need to mind the stack alignment, which is set to 16 bytes. And it's uh, really uh, observed by some functions. So the, the prerequisites from ghostwriting is simply just a place where you can, we can write some, some data. There's no impact from CFG except uh, what we already know about RSP. No, of course, no impact uh, by, from CIG because there's, there are no DLLs involved. And we have control over some registers, which is nice. Now, moving to um, shared memory writing technique. Uh, in this case, uh, the prerequisite is that we know that the uh, target process uh, has a shared memory section. We know its name and we know its size. And now it's pretty uh, predictable if we know the exact software that we are targeting and, and its build, we know whether, there are, uh, uh, sh whether it uses shared memory and, and of what size. So this is, uh, we assume that this knowledge is available to the attacker. So the attacker first maps this uh, shared memory to its own process, writes uh, the payload at the end of this uh, shared memory. Hopefully, it's an area not used by the legitimate software. And then uh, opens the target process uh, and starts looking for uh, scanning its memory uh, region by region, trying to find a region that matches the attributes of the shared memory uh, uh, section. And this, and so we are comparing, we are looking for a map memory, a map and committed uh, with page read write attributes and the exact uh, size that we expect the shared memory to have. Once we find, we also do a read memory to make sure that the payload is at the, at the end of the shared memory. And once we know that, we can start using this as memory written to the, pro to the target process. Uh, so the prerequisites, obviously, is that the target process has a read-write shared memory and that the attacker knows the name and the size. Uh, with respect to CFG, uh, it's probably irrelevant because this memory is typically uh, read and write only, not executable. And CIG, of course, is irrelevant. Now we move to the atom bombing writing technique. So naively speaking, uh, assuming the payload is small and it has, contains no null bytes and except for a terminating null byte, uh, what we have here is the, uh, the uh, essence of this uh, writing technique. We define a global uh, a, an atom object in Windows that uh, contains this payload for in, this, in the malware process, in the injecting process. And then we use NTQAPC thread uh, to invoke the function get global get atom name A in the target uh, process, asking it to copy the value of the atom that we just created uh, into the designated address. Now, uh, this is uh, pretty, uh, pretty neat. The original paper uh, doesn't, try, doesn't uh, provide, uh, uh, doesn't support writing null bytes. It simply assumes that the mem target memory is zeroed out, which is the case because they chose to use a code cave. Uh, we devised the technique to write null bytes, and it's, it's in our paper. The prerequisites are, again, that the thread must be in an alertable state and that the target payload is allocated and writable. As for CFG and CIG, there's no impact, of course. Um, and then we have another uh, interesting uh, allocation and writing technique combined uh, using NT map view of section. 
Uh, in this case, the uh, malware process forces a, a section to be mapped in the target process. It does so by first uh, defining a section, populating it with the desired values, and then uh, opening the target process and uh, do, doing running anti map view of section of the target process uh, of this uh, section into the target process. It's uh, uh, and it, we can also control the. Uh, uh, page attributes, you can uh, ask for executable and, and read, execute and read write. So this cannot be used for already allocated memory. So for example, we cannot write values on the stack using this technique. Uh, and uh, the, the nice thing is, this CFG wise, is that Windows, once, because we requested the page executable, Windows will, will mark the whole region as uh, CFG valid. Um, this is a, a quite fascinating execution technique, the unmap plus rewrite, and it works like this. We, we look at a DLL used heavily in the target process. Anti-DLL is, of course, a prime choice. And then we first copy all the region of this DLL into our own process. Uh, we suspend the target. So f first, we suspend the process. Then we copy the existing NTDLL and, and entire module space into our process. We make a copy of it. We patch it, this copy locally. For example, we can uh, patch NT-close, uh, NT which is heavily used function. And then uh, we unmap the original uh, NTDLL section from the target process and use any uh, writing allocation and writing technique to map and, and write uh, the, uh, the, the patched, the patched uh, NTDLL copy uh, back to where the original NTDLL uh, used to reside in the target process memory. And finally, we flush the instructions from the CPU so that it will not it will forget everything it know it, it thought it knew about those uh, addresses um, and we resume the process now this is uh, quite elegant and of course with with respect to cfg it's a bit tricky because there are many all the entry fa and all the entry uh, 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 addresses in NTDLL must be also uh, be CFG valid uh, now after this uh, switch. Uh, however, fortunately, uh, when using NTMap view of section and uh, virtual allocx, uh, it is guaranteed guaranteed that Windows sets the whole region, in fact, to be uh, CFG valid. So this is taken care of. Um, and there are some. Uh, tips re regarding how not to destabilize the process. Uh, first, we need, of course, to do a process-wise suspend because we can't know which thread will use uh, NTDLL and when. And then the whole thing about copying the complete NTDLL memory and then uh, copying it back instead of just, say, uh, uh, copying parts of NTDLL is because we need to make sure that some uh, variables inside the, N the NTDLL space are consistent. And if we just copy code and not uh, uh, some uh, uh, variables that are part of the uh, static variables, etc., that part of NTDLL will bound to get in, into inconsistency, which will immediately crash the process. So if you do that, copy the whole region. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, callback override execution techniques. Uh, uh, that uh, operate under the same uh, concept. Uh, okay, we have uh, set things from set window, long PTR to uh, shutter-like uh, 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 techniques through LPC, control injects, etc. The idea is that uh, we write we write some code into the target using any writing technique, then find or obtain a memory object with a virtual table, or a callback uh, table. Uh, this may be tricky because uh, it's not uh, not all processes uh, have all objects like uh, ALPC or co some sometimes some objects only uh, exist in console applications. Some objects only exist if the uh, application has a pr private clipboard. 
And this finding or obtaining uh, can be done via standard API like get window long PTR or via memory search like uh, as is the case with LPC. Then we replace this object or callback uh, to point at our uh, desired execution point which must be CFG valid target because Windows will check each and every of those uh, uh, execution techniques in each of every one of them CFG is, is checked. And it may also require some adjustments uh, to the object on the to the code. We trigger execution, which may be tricky because some uh, techniques are not uh, um, deterministic, and we cannot really force uh, the execution uh, upon them. And finally, we restore the original object and callback so the process can resume normally. So this is an example: a control inject, uh, in which uh, we uh, encode a pointer to our desired address and then we copy this pointer uh, to where to the control C uh, handler in the target process which is uh, the, the address of kernel based uh, single handler and finally we trigger execution by uh, first uh, simulating uh, pressing the control key using send input and then uh, sending the C character to the target process now we move to a nice technique that we developed, a uh, uh, nice writing technique we developed uh, based on memset on memmove, in which uh, the idea is that we write uh, arbitrary data to the process on a by, uh, byte at a time. And we use NTQ APC thread uh, with uh, the target function invoked being memset. It's a classic uh, NTDLL function, so it's, it's, there's, there are no CFG problems here. And since memset takes three arguments, the destination address, the byte to write, and how many copies, we simply use it with the address we desire, the byte we desire, and the uh, constant one. And we can loop through our buffer and copy it to the destination address. Uh, by the way, Alon Weinberg, uh, who we will be presenting here at today at 4 p.m., I believe they develop a similar uh, technique. The prerequisites are that the thread must be in an alertable state. We already discussed that. And CFG is not affected because, as I mentioned, NTDLL memset is CFG valid. Finally, there's this, uh, the execution technique we developed. We call uh, stack bombing. Uh, in this case, uh, the idea here is that we overwrite uh, a sing uh, the return address on stack to point at our desired uh, destination address. Now, if the thread happens to be in an alertable state, it becomes pretty simple. The code for uh, an alertable, a, a classic alertable state internal function is this. As I said, uh, the, the code, the, the thread is hanging right after a syscall at, uh, at entry point plus hex 14. And as you can see, what will happen next is an immediate return without touching the stack or the registers. So that if we modified the, the value pointed to, uh, the value on stack pointed to by RSP, we are bound to get execution. Of course, the implementation is much more uh, sophisticated and complex. There is a, a nice proof of concept uh, in our paper and in our uh, uh, Git uh, repository. Uh, and uh, the beauty of this uh, technique is that uh, there is no impact on CFG. Uh, so we can use ROP chain and start executing even if CFG is enabled in the, in the target process. There are two techniques that we could not uh, make, to, we could not implement uh, successfully for Windows 10, the set win event hook and the desktop heap technique. If you manage to run them on Windows 10 x64 version 1903, please, please contact us. We would be delighted to know. To summarize, we looked at six, uh, sorry, five writing techniques, and you can co see the comparison here and in our paper. We also looked at over 20 execution techniques. And uh, you will see that uh, te techniques that are CFG agnostics, marked in the yellow uh, at the uh, right-hand side column, are pretty rare. There are uh, one, two, three, and ours is the fourth. And I, we believe this is the future of process injection. Uh, Quick bonus, if you need to load a DLL, in a system DLL into an arbitrary process maybe, and you don't have a writing technique to write its path uh, into the process first, maybe your, whole ROP, maybe your favorite ROP gadget is there, 
uh, we have good news for you. Kernel-based.dll contains uh, the names of uh, more than a thousand system DLLs, including some things like mshtml.dll, shell32.dll, and win9net.dll. And you can use that uh, to load this, uh, the DLL using load library A. And with that, I hand it over to you, Itzik. Thank you, Amit. <coughs> so as Amit mentioned, our research was not only theory, there's also the practical implementation side of it. And as we went through and scraping different proof of concept, trying to compile together, we decided to take it to the next level and create Pinjectra. So in a nutshell, Pinjectra is a framework that allows you to combine, mix and match, different elements uh, as Amit presented, writing and execution, and obviously the payload in a mix and match style. And we're going to see it in the next few slides. Feel free to go to the GitHub right now and download your copy. Okay. So once you'll go to the GitHub, you will see that the Pinjectra solution is basically made from four major projects. As Amit mentioned, some of the injection techniques requires an artifact, a DLL. We already provided it for you. So the first two projects here are DLLs that are implementing certain interfaces so they can be easily used for the purpose of the injection. The other two is the Pinjectra itself, which contains the library of the knowledge as well as the implementation. And also for your convenience, we also released a test process. This is a dummy program that puts itself into an alertable state. As Amit mentioned, it's a prerequisite for certain attacks techniques. And so this will do the job for you. Now let's step a little bit outside and understand what's the philosophy. As I mentioned, Pinjectra is a mix and match. It's using object oriented, so we leverage the C, C++ static type system to create different classes from different types. And so it's very easily kind of mixing together into a full attack. And how does it look like? Pretty much like that. So what you can see right now is the implementation of our new technique, the stack bombing in Pinjectra. It's very easy, it's very clean, it's very elegant. We're looking on three major classes here. The first one, code via, which provides the actual execution. So that's a class of an execution technique. Then we can see the NetQ APC thread, that's the writing technique. And then at the end we can see the rope chain, that's class representing of the payload. The mix and match philosophy means that you can now play and try different techniques, different primitives, and see how they can combine together. You can obviously create the new ones and then explore different avenues. And now all this wrapped up in a very nice model. At the end of it there is a method for this class called inject that ex expects the process ID and thread ID and there you have it. And now let's go into a demo. No. Some technical difficulties. Okay, so what you can see here is two CMD consoles. There's a red one, which will be the attacker, and the green one, which will be the attackee or the victim. So right now, we're first going to run the test process. Again, as I mentioned, that the purpose of that was to be the victim of the process injection. As you can see, running it will conveniently print the process ID, thread ID, as well as we'll put it into an loadable state. Going into the Pinjectra, we will run it once without any parameters. That will give us the usage of all the different attacks that are possible within the demo. Now, finding the right combination with the process ID and thread ID will invoke the actual injection. In our payload, by default, we're using a very nifty hello box word. So that's, that's the process that you will have if you have a successful injection using Pinjectra right now. Okay, and as a bonus, uh, which we've seen for the last second there, the process itself continues to run as interruptibly. So again, the process doesn't crash, it keeps running. 
Moving on to a few other techniques that Amit has mentioned and how they can be, how can it be implemented within Pinjectra. Here's the ghostwriting technique. So as you can see, we're using conceptually the suspend inject resume design pattern, not to be confused with the set thread context technique that Amit has presented for the classical SEER. Then we have the ghost writing as the actual writing primitive, and then that accepts the payload. So again, a pretty fairly simple way to combine different techniques into a one fusion process. So let's check this demo as well. Okay, so the same idea applies. We're creating a green process to be injected to. And then we're going into Pinjectra. Again, running it without any parameters, we will see the different usage that contains the different options. Giving it the process ID and thread ID. And we pop the box. Thank you. Okay. Uh, again, continuing with the series of demos that we have planned for you today, as Amit mentioned, the uh, very exotic and uh, interesting technique of the unmap and map, which includes many different steps in the way. Again, with Pinject, probably broken down into these three different classes. For the people here that were uh, keeping notes on the actual class names, you can see that the code via suspend inject and resume underscore complex was already actually used in our own implementation of the stack bombing. This is just one of the features of using these libraries, the ability to reuse existing code and logic. And so we do not have to re-implement the uh, conceptual execution technique. We can then just focus on the create file mapping map file map view file np on map and map of the of the section this is the combination that essentially identifies this technique and of course the payload that has been accepted as the payload comes on top of it Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so the idea again is we're creating a, a green process and a red process. In this case, as Amit mentioned, our test process was not complicated enough to include all the different uh, results and APIs. And so basically, we also provided this very small batch file to simply return the uh, PID of the explorer. So in this case, we're going to actually attack explorer itself. So that gave us back the PID of the explorer process. And now going to Pinjectra, we're going to use that as the destination of the process injection. Takes a little bit of a time. And here it is. Okay, uh, the set window long pointer is quite an interesting implementation. As Amit mentioned, we need to retrieve the actual structure and then change the callback within it. So for here, it's actually a mixture of an execution technique which stands on its own. That's the code via set window long PTR. And then what we actually did is uh, within the framework, we refactor one of the most primitive techniques, which is a combination of virtual uh, allocation and write memory in conjunction with a payload. And the connector that actually brings them together is a metadata that calls complex immutable advanced memory writer. As you will dive into the framework, you will see there's different types of classes to accommodate different types of attacks. That is an actually a converter that we created for the purpose of this attack. So let's jump into the demo. It's important to mention that since this attack requires retrieval of a specific structure, it's much easier to find, to implement the discovery of finding of explorer within the attack itself, and that's what you're going to see right now. So there's not going to be any green screen right now. It's all only be contained within Pinjectra. So 
will pass zero, 00 as an indication that, again, Pinjector method will come out with the PAD and TAD of Explorer while using the set long window PTR API. And here it is. Okay, and last but not least, let's talk about the atom bombing technique and how it's implemented again within Pinjectra. As you can see, the uh, Q user APC is used as the code execution technique, and then the sequence of open thread, open process, virtual allocate, and global add atom A are the actual writing sequence. And again, you can see you can control the different parameters and you can control the function that retains the payload. And having said that, let's see how it looks on our platform. So here again we will be using the PID of the actual explorer to perform the actual uh, testing. Again we need a, a much complex process providing the PID and TID of explorer. Takes a, a second there and boom. Ex excellent. Thank you. And with that back to Amit. Thank you Itzik. So what have we seen today? Uh, we have we we have actually three deliverables you know through our project. One is a mapping of the vast territory of true process injection, and together with that we provide an analysis and comparison. It's all in a single collection repository compendium, however way you like to call it. Uh, it's part of the DEFCON. Uh, deliverables uh, from our side which so it's a PDF uh, document uh, for your uh, enjoyment and pleasure it's also uh, on our website we also provide uh, this uh, library that uh, it's uh, demonstrated called the uh, Pinjectra for a uh, mix and match generation of uh, process injection attacks now this is extremely important because a lot of the POCs out there will uh, couple a single uh, new say memory writing technique like in atom bombing with a single execution technique just to demonstrate that and this becomes the atom bombing process injection uh, technique so if you're if you want to test your environment against or your system against uh, atom bombing you may as well test that with not just a single execution technique but uh, uh, the, the all the array of possible execution techniques that, that can be coupled to, to atom bombing and that's exactly what we provide with Pinjector the ability to couple or to match any almost any writing technique with almost any execution technique and thereby we allow uh, red teamers, blue teamers, uh, security researchers to cover almost all the possible all possible uh, combinations in this uh, in this uh, universe finally we also describe a new cfg agnostic execution technique and i remind you that this i, I believe that this is the future of process injections the the ones that are based on uh, uh, cfg agnostic execution techniques which we call stack bombing and with that, and coupled with that, we also uh, de we also uh, uh, described a new memory technique using a memset and memmove over APC. So that's our three deliverables. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.